My guest today on Dan's Talks is Diana Witt Walker, who is the director of the South Holt Historical Society. And um, how are you? And how is everything up there on the North Fork where it's a little colder than uh, down here on the South Fork where I am? Good morning, Dan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here first. Let me just thank you for having me on today, especially on behalf of our board of trustees here at South Holt Historical Museum. All is well up here, although it is a damp day, as I'm sure it is over on the South Fork as well. I think that's typical, you know, this time of year, we get used to that dampness. Um, tell me a little bit about the uh, facilities that you oversee on the North Fork and what each of them does. I presume there's more than one. In fact, there is. There are three museum locations that we have here at Southold Historical. Um, I'm in our Prince building, which dates back to the 1800s. And here we have our offices, our archives, where we keep our paper documents and photos, and our shops, our museum gift shop, and our resale shop. And then we have a nautical museum actually in the Horton Point Lighthouse that a lot of times people don't realize that we are connected with Horton Point Lighthouse. Where um, is the, you know, Horton Lighthouse? Yeah and that's it. The lighthouse is off of the North Road so it's up on the Sound um, at the top of Lighthouse Road so it, it, you do take a few back roads to get up there and it's in a beautiful location high up the cliff overlooking Long Island Sound and it is accessible. You can park. We're open in the summers to come into the museum. Um, the grounds are beautiful also. They're they're owned by the South Hold Park District. And it's a nice place. There are some trails um, there as well. And so it's a great spot for a picnic, a great spot for a visit with multiple generations, because you know, who doesn't like a lighthouse? And we've got um a museum filled with some artifacts inside as well. What, um, who was Horton and why did he build the lighthouse? So that's a good question, Dan. And um, you're testing me on some of my history here, but Barnabas Horton dates back to one of our original um, English settlers here in South Hold, And he owned a cliff lot over there on the Sound. What? And so a cliff lot, so it wasn't his primary oh. residence, but part of his, his property. And when George Washington came and deemed that as a spot for a lighthouse, that was that property was owned by Horton. So hence the name Horton Point Lighthouse. Um, it came. It was almost a year, hundred years later before the lighthouse was actually built. Um, I believe it's 1867. I believe. Um, and at that point, it was no longer owned by Hortons, but it kept the name the Horton Point Lighthouse. Where is it in relation to Greenport or? Um... Uh, I guess is it is it out there? I mean, there's the lighthouse off of uh, the North Fork, which is a different thing. So why would there be a lighthouse at this cliff? That's a great question. Um, so the the land, you know, as you look down, you can you can see out into Connecticut, obviously, but as you look down, that water there has a lot of rocks and protrusions underneath the surface that. There were many shipwrecks um, over the years that took place there. Actually, it was nicknamed Dead Man's Cove um, because uh -huh. of the shipwrecks. Yes. So um, hence the reason for the lighthouse. Um, it doesn't jut out. It is smooth along, you know, the coast there. It's just that what's what lies beneath is really the concern for mariners. Is it still operational? Absolutely. It's a navigational tool. Um, it's a green light and our volunteers that are experts on this could tell you how many seconds it takes to to, you know, rotate and blink. Um, but it can be seen from from Connecticut and, and miles out. And uh, is it up, up past Greenport or or is it? Oh, uh, no, it's it's right smack in the middle of South Hold. So um, the intersection is I believe it's Old North Road where you go up. Um, where you, you'd head north and then that leads to Lighthouse Road and that on the south side that's Young's Avenue so it's really um, central in terms of east west west but obviously as north as you can go in that area of South. Can, can you tour the lighthouse can you climb around in it? You can. Um, the lighthouse is open seasonally so our volunteers are there on Saturdays and Sundays and um, they from about Memorial Day to mid-September and they give a really nice tour, including um, the steps up 
you can go up to the tower and we have a volunteer up there that will talk some more about what you're seeing from the top of the tower. Wow, that's great. And you can picnic on the lawn? You can. It's a beautiful spot for a picnic. Um, the park, like I say, the park district really keeps it nice. And um, we have a nice partnership with them that as long as we have a museum in there and we open to the public and, and welcome people in, uh, we can use that space, you know, for, for our, our purposes. Is uh, there any special thing in the museum that is uh, unique or is it just of the era? It's interesting that you mentioned this because we just were up there at the, the museum last week because we're we're redoing some of the exhibits, uh, reinterpreting or or just freshening up. And so we were looking at what some of the most popular artifacts are and, um, you know, maybe the things that we have too many of. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would say that one of the, the key focus is the Fresnel lens that we have on exhibit there. People are very interested in how that like the light and how that would be used as the lantern for the lighthouse. So, so that's that's a big one. And is that still up top? Um, no, we no longer, the Fresnel is no longer used. In fact, actually this last year, the Coast Guard upgraded the light that is in Horton Point, but the Fresnel is, in, is downstairs in our exhibit space. So people can, can get an understanding of how their light reflects. And what, what you mentioned, there were three, uh... Well, locations. Yes. What was the third? Absolutely. Yeah. So our third location is our Maple Lane complex. And we have a roughly 13 buildings there, most of which are open to the public, um, again, seasonally during the summer months on the weekends. And we have our original museum location there, which is the home of Anne Halleck Curry Bell, who was the founder of the museum, um, a 1700s home, the Thomas More House, as well as a 1700s barn that was moved to the location and various other buildings as well. Where is that exactly? That is right on the main road. So as you go through South Hold and you go through the light, um, we come up on the right there and it's it's a long complex uh, it, it's a little bit hard to see from the main road because it is set back. Obviously, the the original house, which was built in 1900, was built further back from the road. You wouldn't build so close. Um, but it's across from the Southhold Fire Department. So that's a good landmark for us. And a lot of stuff, a lot of different pieces were brought there to uh, as a sort of a home for history. Exactly, Dan. Two of the buildings are on their original locate, you know, original sites, but all of the others were moved there, including a corn crib, an ice house, um, a couple of uh, the Lahamadu barn, which is an open barn that was part of uh, the prop that originally belonged to Lahamadu and was moved there. Uh, we have a print shop, which was was originally uh, meant to be a carriage house. Blacksmith shop, a treasure of, of buildings there, indeed. <laughs> and, uh, did you say this whole complex is called Lamadu? No, um, th it's the Maple Lane complex, but there's a Lahamadu barn, Lamadu barn there. I yeah, hope I'm saying it exactly right. <laughs> say say again the name. I have Maybelline, which is, is that what it's called? <laughs> <a> no. <laughs> Um, Ezra Lahamadu was here in this in, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and was active in the Continental Congress. And yeah. so that's where that, you know, is is most noteworthy for us. And the barn had been originally part of his property on the main road and then later had had another location in between, but then later portions of it were moved onto our complex. He was uh, also uh, instrumental in the uh, Montauk Lighthouse and several other uh, several other pro uh, projects during the revolutionary period. That's interesting. But, I didn't realize that, but that makes sense, right? Because this is the time when the lighthouses were deemed necessary, and and really the spots were marked. Yeah, and he yeah. was he was one of the uh, major figures in Southold for that era. Um, is there um, are there any was there ever a battle or any kind of uh, historical event that occurred that, that this happens in the town of Southall? Well, so now you're getting really fast my, my area of expertise. But um, 
I can tell you, so so I usually defer to our collections manager when it comes to some of the research questions or some of the history because she also happens to be our Southfield Town historian. So all of this definitely falls in her area, uh, you know, or her purview. However, I am familiar, um, interest is, interestingly, what prompted me to learn a little bit about Meg's raid was that we have a commemorative brick garden on our Maple Lane complex and people purchase bricks for all sorts of different reasons. It's it's fascinating when you when you go through something like that, um, uh, what, what the inscriptions are. And very often it's their ties to Southhold, right? In one way or another, whether they're a, a, a descendant or whether they just purchased a house here. And one person um, commemorated Meg's raid on a brick. And so I had to say, all right, what's Meg's raid? And, and this is during the, you know, the time of the American Revolution when they came across the Sound and across Long Island to, um, you know, combat with the British and then headed back north again. So Meg's raid came directly through Southold at that time period during the Revolution. Yep. It, it occurred on the Long Wharf in Sag Harbor. And uh, they carried all the... Uh, boats across the land. It was a narrow strip of land that uh, maybe 50 yards at most that it was portage. They picked up the boats. There were 90 of them in the raid. And they picked up their whale boats and carried them from the sound into the bay and then crossed to Sag Harbor during the night. So I know this story too. You do. You know more of it than I do. I, don't know. I probably do because it's really a South Fork story yeah. mostly but tell me a little about um yourself how did you become uh interested in in uh so in south holds and its history and mm -hmm. uh take on this job yeah so um that's a great question and it was really just um by by chance that i end up ended up in this role eventually i I'm not from the east end originally i am a transplant and i've been out here for about 24 years and our children where, where, where are you from originally i'm from new hyde park so from nassau county oh um, way out there <laughs> yeah yeah up um, island. i'm sorry what was that up island exactly up island as we as we now say um but i raised my husband and i raised our children out here and when the kids were old enough and I wanted to go back to work. I looked for something part-time. And at the time, Oyster Ponds Historical Society, one of the other local um, historical societies, was looking for part-time help. And so I started there and suddenly realized that I really liked learning about local history and also working for a nonprofit where there were so many volunteers who both felt, you know, fat, passionate about the, the mission and also were willing to give their time so freely. I really enjoyed that environment. So uh, 11 plus years ago, when the position opened here for an office administrator, I applied and I came to South Holt Historical part-time. As the time passed, um, I kind of worked my way, uh, gaining more experience here and, it was three years ago, October, that the that I was promoted to the executive director here at the museum. So I've been here eleven years and and in this position for a little more than three years and enjoying it very much. Have there been any interesting things that have occurred in your in your ten years here in connected with the uh, Southhold uh, Museum? Well, I would say, um, you know, well, COVID, <laughs> certainly COVID was something that kind of came on that took us all by surprise, right? And so navigating our way through how we as a nonprofit were going to manage uh, was a challenge. And, and fortunately, you know, we really came out unscathed and, and in some ways with more support from the community. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, one of the initiatives that we started last year was a rebranding initiative. And we are chartered by the New York State Board of Education as Southhold Historical Society. Um, and we found that a lot of um, people had misconceptions about what a historical society was. Um, if you weren't familiar with them, you might think it was a club, um, not realizing that it was a museum, you know, welcoming and open to the public. So we changed our name slightly from Historical Society to Southhold Historical 
Museum, updated our logo so that it represented our farming and fishing heritage, and did a big kickoff last, last July 1st when we reopened after COVID. So I was proud of that and, and it's been successful. We, we think that people um, have embraced the concept of us as a museum. Um, have you been involved at all with uh, the history involving Albert Einstein? That's a good question. Um, we all are all fascinated with Einstein's time here on the North Fork. And when the Rothman's department store, which is literally directly out that window <laughs> across the street from me uh, was up for sale, the people that purchased it um, restored it and named it Einstein Square. So across the street, there's a bust of Einstein as well as a photo, um, a, a painting based on a photo that was taken of Rothman and Einstein during their during Einstein's time here on North, on the North Fork. He rented a house. Oh, go ahead. Oh, my question was how, explain the uh, connection yeah. between Rothman and Einstein. Absolutely. So um, Einstein rented a house in Nassau Point for three summers, actually. Um, and on the water down by Old Cove Road. And he had been in town here in Southhold and walked into Rothman's department store um, and befriended Roth David Rothman. Um, there's a story because there's there's there are photos of him, professional photographs, and he's wearing sandals. And there's a story about the sandals in that uh, Einstein, you know, with a German accent, wa walked in and asked about whether he could purchase sandals there and Rothman thought he was referring to a sundial that he wanted a sundial and took okay. him in the back and said well I don't have any for sale but I do have this one um offered his him his own um and he didn't have men's sandals so instead he sold him women's you know size 10 sandals which Einstein is depicted in uh, but also the two became friends and so they would have evenings where they would play you know Einstein was a musician he played the violin where they would have musical interludes with others um, on, the, on the North Fork at that time, including Benjamin Britten um, and other you know, noteworthy people. One other thing, if, if you'll indulge me, that's, that's interesting is that Einstein wrote a letter to FDR or the letter, it's a very well-known letter about the Manhattan Project or the atomic bomb, and that he felt that the, we needed to hurry up, you know, I don't have the exact quotes, but that we needed to rush our move along so that we didn't let the Germans beat us to the development of that atomic bomb. And um, that led to the Manhattan Project that we that we know of today. And he wrote it from that house in NASA, NASA Point. Yep, I know that story. Ben, uh, ben Benjamin Britten was a famous composer. And I, as I recall, he was a young man at that time. He was. And was, uh, I've, I've read about him being like very brooding and and, uh, and withdrawn in some way. I um, don't know a lot of the history. I should because I do have some uh, you know music in my background and in my family. I should know more. Um, I know that some of his his compositions actually refer to this area as well. You know, in the titles. Um, but it was during his younger years, and and it really sounds like they were a talented group. Um, when you read some of Rothman's, uh, you know, his his own uh, not diary, his journal, he says, you know, he was just the novice in the group. But it it sounds like it must have been, you know, to be a fly on the wall during that time would have been really interesting. Yep. Well, thank you for uh, coming on. I appreciate it very much, and uh, I'm learning here a lot about how. Uh, things that I was unfamiliar with because basically I'm a South Worker yeah. going way back. There is, there is, we won't would have time to talk about it, but both Southhold and Southampton uh, declare themselves to have been the first English settlement uh, on the uh, East End and uh, the claims go back and forth and they've still been discussing it now 300 and 50 years later, I guess it is something to that effect. And I want to thank you for being on the podcast and uh, uh, appreciate it. And uh, I will see you soon. I'll stop by and we'll take a picnic up there at Horton's. Summer. We'd love that. Thank you so very much, Dan. Really appreciate it. Sure. Bye-bye. Be well.